Welcome back to another episode of The Daily Show. I uh, wonder what you've been doing. As for me, well, I'm getting ready for today's episode. I hope all is well with, uh, with all of you, our friends, our students, especially um, our family Discovery Day program. I hope you guys are doing well. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, doesn't matter what time you guys watch this. This is good for the whole day. Actually, not just for the whole day, but pretty much any time. <laughs> just in case you you uh, you miss this episode, feel free to go back to our channel and just you know uh, give it a watch. Give it a watch. Is that a thing? Anyways, guys, uh, this episode is for November two, and yes, we are done with October already. So we are hitting, or we are here at November. November two. That means at the end of the month, we're gonna be doing, or we're gonna have some Thanksgiving. Um, and black friday and uh wait i think that's pretty much it as far as the major holidays are are concerned you know but anyways for today we'll talk about uh all souls day there you go which happened after all saints day um we're gonna be mainly talking about its history how it was formed and all uh followed by <clears throat> another observance called the uh, broadcast traffic professionals um something that that uh, I would say like usual enough uh, or not 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 so familiar not so familiar enough right for that kind of profession and then we'll also talk about now something that is very um, familiar cookie monster <laughs> there you go and then um, for today in history we'll talk about the first residential crew boarding the International Space Station or ISS and then we'll travel virtual travel to uh, Dominican Republic to talk about their national symbols and as usual stay tuned for our stuff of the day oh yeah speaking of which um, I think the only thing that I changed for this month's stuff of the day would be the the trivia and the word but uh, or the word of the day but we'll get to it all right let's go ahead and start oh let me clear my throat first <clears> there <throat> you go it's getting dry. All right, first up, All Souls Day. So again, this this um, observance is a major holiday for people of Christ Christian faith. All right, so but that means if you're uh, of a different belief, then feel free to skip this one. However, if you want to learn more about it, well, you know, yeah, stick with us, and we're gonna be uh, we'll we'll talk about the uh, history of uh, this observance. So. Um, All Souls Day commemorates the souls of the deceased uh, Christians, or the Christians who passed away. It developed out of All Saints Day, which happened the day before, November 1st. Um, and is associated with the uh, holiday and Halloween. Um, there are a variation, variation of beliefs and practices observed among different churches on the day. Uh, for example, for Catholics, the day is for praying for the souls. Of those who are who passed away and in purgatory so if uh, again if you guys are not in a like say Catholic faith uh, purgatory is kind of like a, a place <clears throat> that is not heaven and that is not earth and that's where people are left or uh, uh, people who are trying to cross the the afterlife you know they stay there until they get judged um, and then in the late 10th or early 11th century Saint Odilo of Cluny decided that All Souls Day would take place after All Saints Day. Um, all Catholic monasteries uh, that were dependent on the Abbey of Cluny were to observe the day. And then uh, in Protestant, in Protestant denomination, um, similar practices have been adhered or adhered, sorry, to as the uh, Anglican Church. There you go. And the day is not as practiced as much as it is in the Catholic Church. Um, Eastern churches celebrate the day during the uh, different time of the year altogether. <clears throat> in some countries, such as Mexico, um, it is known as the Day of the Dead or the uh, Dia, Dia de la Muerta. Right there. Um, it is observed as such uh, in parts of the United States with large Latin American communities as well. So. Um, as as far as the uh, the how the Mexicans observed it or observe it, 
um, it's more lively actually, and they uh, they they implement a lot of uh, uh, colors. You know, um, you're gonna see like if they go to or if you happen to see someone uh, celebrating Dila, BL de la Muerta, they're they're making it actually they're making it livelier. You know, because. <clears throat> I guess the default take on let's say All Souls Day because it's talking about like a people who passed away, right? Uh, especially on Christian faith, um, they, it, it, um, I wouldn't say lively, more like mellow and uh, unfortunately sometimes sad, you know, because it's a remembrance of uh, uh, someone who passed away. But for uh, Mexico, you know, in Mexico, it's more of a celebration of their time here with us, you know, for the people who. Uh, on that time that they were with us so yeah uh, and it's pretty interesting to realize that different countries have different approach on how they um, uh, w w when it comes to uh, their loved ones their friends and other people's uh, passing so if I'm being honest I would actually prefer making a celebration you know um, first it's livelier <laughs> and uh, second it, you would like you would rather remember someone uh from the time they were with you instead of from the time they you, you lost them so and again that's just my personal preference but um just to make it clear also Day is different from dia de la muerta it's totally different observance but it just happened to have uh, uh, that that mexico has a um i would say similar observance it's about you know a person's passing or uh the people's passing on the um on the day on the same day so yes there you go and then next up <clears throat> we have broadcast traffic professionals day now again this is one of those unusual professions that uh you probably not might not have heard of i mean i personally haven't heard of it uh, but it's a pretty interesting profession so According to the Traffic Directors Guild of America, or TDGA, Broadcast Traffic Professionals Day, which often goes by other names such as Traffic Directors Day and National Traffic Directors Day, honors those um, in all radio and television traffic departments who scheduled and work very diligently with programs, announcements, and much more. Much more, I would say, including the uh, uh, commercials, advertisements, you know? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> they're the ones managing when to cut the program to insert some um, announcements or in, in, insert some advertisement and all and that's that's a pretty challenging uh, job too and then sometimes if there's gonna be an emergency you kind of have to like cut off the uh, the the broadcast you know um, if you guys remember one of the instances where uh, it, it was a sports game at least the one that we talked about and then Suddenly got cut off, and, but that, that was in the radio. But you know the um, traffic directors or uh, broadcast traffic professionals—they also work in both uh, television and um, radios. And since the technology is uh, advancing uh, more and more as the day goes by, we also have some form of media on uh, on the internet now. You know, so that's also another field that these professionals. Uh, cover um, <clears throat> so and again uh, um, one more reason that they don't sound um, that familiar because they work behind the scenes um, so what they do is they work with the aspects of continuity billing and production particularly when it comes to scheduling commercials um, this day is held each November 2nd unless that day falls on a weekend then it is held on the following Monday so uh, it's not always gonna be November 2nd but if let, let's say November 2nd falls into a Sunday or a weekend then yeah you're uh, gonna celebrate this or this observance is gonna be on mon on uh, the following Monday instead um, so how do you celebrate this well I'm not sure if you would know someone, a family or a friend that actually works like that. Um, or you know what, just I guess in general, if you know someone who works at a radio station or a, a TV station, um, 
but I don't know if there's a lot of people still listen, watching TV now. I mean, I personally don't watch TV anymore. Um, it's all like, uh, what do you call this? Uh, internet stuff now, you know? Like you can, as long as you have access to the internet, you can get the information you want and I guess the entertainment that you like um, faster than the one in the um, television. So, but if you know someone who works on a radio station or TV uh, station, uh give them a thanks you know uh or give them your appreciation tell them that hey you know what i just learned about your profession i haven't heard about it um but uh i've learned that you're working behind the scenes and i appreciate it i appreciate it i, I appreciate your hard work there you go so yeah so those are our uh um oh wait no not yet <laughs> i don't know why i'm saying that we're just on the second observance um, we have the last one, or rather not the last one, the third one, because we're going to have some other notable observances. Um, anyways, Cookie Monster Day. Now, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, last year I still, I talked about Cookie Monster, but as a notable figure born today. Because Cookie Monster Day essentially is the day when Cookie Monster uh, appeared, or his character appeared in the uh, children's educational show the uh, sesame street so yeah so today's his birthday um <clears throat> he was created in, around uh, or he debuted on sesame street in 1969 but cookie monster um <clears throat> got his start in the 1966 um as a wheel stealer on an unaired general mills commercial for snack food so before he even became a member of Sesame Street, he actually had like a, a commercial, a solo commercial with him as the mascot. And uh, yeah, his name wasn't Cookie Monster, yeah, it was Wheel Stealer. You know? And then the following year, the monster was featured in an IBM training film uh, that included self destructing coffee break machine. <laughs> oh man, so Cookie Monster really has that monster title uh, with him. Um, on October 8, 1967, uh, this kit appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. Um, the Cookie Monster prototype next appeared as Arnold in three commercials for Munchos, a uh, potato snack from Frito-Lay. <clears throat> and then Henson, um, he's the one who, uh, what do you call this, uh, created um, Cookie Monster. Uh, his full name is Jim Henson. So Henson could have kept making more commercials with the monster but brought him to Sesame Street instead. So that's when Cookie Monster started become a member of uh, our friends with Big Bird and uh, Elmo, Bart, Ernie, and many more. Um, so when when Cookie Monster first appeared on Sesame Street, his role was I mean he doesn't have a classic or uh, a specific role rather, um, and he didn't have a name that time yet. So nobody <laughs> he he's not called Cookie Monster yet. But by the second season, he came into his own and became one of the most popular characters in the show. Um, he is known for his blue fur, uh, googly eyes, and simple language like, Me one cookie! There you go, that's his one of his uh, famous lines. And the appetite to eat everything. Uh, not just cookies, but he does love cookies though. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, let's see, I do have uh, more interesting facts about Cookie Monster. For one would be his first name was actually Sid. So before they um, decided to call him or to call it Cookie Monster, um, its name was Sid. But, you know, it's not as catchy as Cookie Monster. I mean, at least for kids, I'm just saying. And then it takes two puppeteers to manipulate Cookie Monster. So compared to other puppets and uh, in the show, Cookie Monster uh, requires two people to manipulate or to control to control and then um, speaking of the foods that uh, Cookie Monster likes to eat um, the cookies right but those are not real cookies they are those cookies are actually uh, rice crackers yeah um, they kind of just made it look like cookies because they can't use real cookies what's gonna happen if they use real cookies uh, the oils uh, from actual cookies would damage the puppet and considering that Cookie Monster is gonna put the cookie 
in its mouth, well, you know, it's gonna damage the mouth um, later on. So instead, they used a uh, rice crackers as substitute, uh, which doesn't contain any oils that could damage the puppet. So there you go. Alrighty, so that's uh, those are the main observances we talk about today. We still have other notable observances. Um, the first one here on this segment: look for Circles Day. So, pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Uh, this holiday is geared, or observance is geared towards young children who are learning to recognize shapes. And well, it's not just limited to kids. This is the thing. I mean, it's a fun activity to do if you don't have anything else to do. You know, look for circles and and find or, or figure out how many circles can you find in, in a day. So there you go, pretty straightforward, right? Next up, uh, practice being a psychic day. Um, pretty interesting in that one, right? Um, what is being a psychic? Well, being a psychic means being sensitive to non-physical or supernatural forces and influences marked by extraordinary or mysterious sensitivity, perception, or understanding. Um, some of the abilities psychics claim are, let's say, seeing uh, the future, you know, seeing what's going to happen um, ahead, uh, talking to the disease. Mm, that's another uh, abilities that they claim to, to be able to do, you know, um, in a different dimension. And knowing some, let's say, information on a stranger that are not being disclosed to them. Like, it, I mean, they have, if they have the ability to, to see the future, they also claim to have the ability to look at someone's past without that person telling them. Um, a lot of uh, people, or a lot of quote-unquote psychi psychics, would claim those, at, at least one of those abilities. Um, the thing though is that some of these psychics or some of these people uh, claiming to be psychic have been debunked or revealed to be fraud. Um, but of course, that doesn't stop other people to believe in this ability, you know? Not this, I mean, I meant this ability, this, this, I guess you can say skill or power, you know? As of today, um, the search for knowledge about this topic or, you know, about, about the information about being psychic uh, is still ongoing as we currently have not enough evidence to make a solid argument. But that also means that people do not fully discredit the possibility or being a psychic is a possibility, you know? Um, if you're like me though, who needs more viable evidence before entirely accepting or dismissing uh, a topic, for example, you know, the psychic, uh, well, you can consider yourself a skeptic. And that is my segue to the last notable observance right there. Um, it's quite interesting to see that in one day you have opposing, um, what do you call this, opposing observance. Uh, because there's one, uh, practice being a psychic day, which is not really tied to reality. You know, even though a lot of people are claiming. And the thing about that is I cannot discredit them because I don't have any proof that it doesn't exist. But I also don't have proof that it exists. So, until there's viable proof, that's when I'm gonna believe. Um, so I'm skeptic about that. And then, the last one, Skeptic Day International, is about being a doubter. Or a questioner of something that many believe to be factual or truthful. Um, such as a piece of scientific evidence, or religious evidence, or philosophical knowledge. Right there, instead of taking something at face value, like, oh yeah, it's this one. Uh, I'm just gonna accept it, you know. Uh, why not try to question uh, or come up with questions about that um, that knowledge, that information, you know. Uh, the word skepticism comes from the Greek word skeptomai, which means to think or consider. So, uh, oh, here's a, 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 the thing that I want you guys to focus on. Skepticism is a method of inquiry, not a set of conclusions. Unfortunately, a lot of people uh, claim to be skeptics, but they would conclude things right away. That's not how skepticism works. If you're skeptic, uh, you're not sure. You cannot conclude about something, you know? So, 
uh, what do you call this? A, a good example would be, let's say, the, uh, you know, back in the day, a lot of people are, when I say back in the day, I meant long time ago, um, people would believe that the Earth is flat. You know, what's funny, though, is up until now, there are people who believe that the Earth is flat. Um, so, anyways, yeah, uh, people, uh, there are people who believe that the Earth is flat, especially long time ago, where if you um if you say the opposite or if you try to challenge that you get persecuted you know but thanks to the other skeptics you know um who questioned the integrity of the earth being flat now we all know that the earth is a globe it's it's round it's round like a ball well not exactly like a ball but yes like that right so Imagine if nobody became skeptic. Maybe up until now, we're all gonna believe that um, uh, the Earth is flat. Or worse, we're probably not going to try to invade the uh, invent the rocket ship, which is one of the most one of the best inventions that we ever came up with. You know, now we're able to get out of the atmosphere of uh, of our own planet to uh, to observe further stars to observe further planets right so skepticism has has helped us uh make significant progression there you go especially in science and technology and knowledge in general so yeah um but of course you don't want to be over skeptic too i mean like if there's uh if you tried a lot of uh research if you did a lot of research uh, tried a lot of experiments and uh you got like a a solid proof or results that is accurate enough then yes you can you can st stop there okay you can stop there um, and uh, accept that as the answer as the truth as the uh, as fact now um, there might be another question that will be posed related to that object that item or that information then you can challenge it again so being a skeptic is Part of learning and learning is a continuous process us human beings cannot just be contented of what we learned today um, it's always best it's always better to uh, keep learning to learn more things uh, granted we're gonna be forgetting some of the things that we learned uh, back in the past you know but it's the experience that we gain it's the knowledge that we gain that uh, makes us better and uh, uh, I guess makes us uh, wiser. There you go. So those are our observances for today. I can't believe it's already 23 minutes. <laughs> we just talked about six observances, but yeah, uh, we got three main ones and three other notable ones. So I don't know if if ever I'm gonna try to practice being a psychic. <laughs> See if I have some psychic powers. You know, um, I think part of being a psychic also that I didn't mention would be like uh, moving moving things without you touching him and kind of using your mind to move things uh, I, I could be wrong I don't think that's psychic but yeah um, yeah there you go <laughs> all right today in history so we got two before we talked about the International Space Station this is the first one in 1947 Howard Hughes spruce Goose flight um, so uh, <clears throat> Howard Hughes is the uh, pilot um and, oh i mean the uh designer oh wait well pilot he's the one who flew it and also the designer um of this plane right here um what happened was uh let's see oh the plane was built with laminated birch and spruce hence the nickname spruce goose um the massive wooden aircraft had a wingspan longer than a football field and was designed to carry more than 700 men to battle. Um, Howard Hughes was a successful Hollywood movie producer when he founded the Hughes Aircraft Company in 1932. Um, he personally tested cutting-edge aircraft of his own design and in 1937 broke the uh, transcontinental flight time record. Then in 1939, he flew around the world in a record of three days 19 hours and 14 minutes wow there you go 
Um, speaking of tr flying around the world, um, I, if if ever I get the opportunity, I would try it. You know, I would try it as long as I get enough food and water on the plane. <laughs> so yeah. All right, now going to the international uh, international space station. Uh, in 2000, the first residential crew arrives aboard the ISS or International Space Station. Um, the space agencies of the United States, Russia, Canada, Japan, and Europe agreed to cooperate on the International Space Station in 1998, and its first components were launched into orbit later that year. Um, five space shuttle flights and two unmanned Russian flights delivered many of its core components and then partially assembled the space station. So they didn't build it in one go i mean we or us humans uh had like five trips you know getting the materials from here on land and earth bringing it up there and started uh doing some lego things kind of like connect things together there you go um two russians yuri gidzenko and sergey Krika krikalev Accompanied the NASA's Bill Shepard, um, were selected or accompanied by NASA's Bill Shepard, uh, were selected as the crew of the Expedition One. And now we have the International Space Station, and yes, it's called International because again, like countries, different countries actually work together to form this. So this is for everyone. Well, this is for not just one country, but for multiple countries. All right, we're going for the notable figure born today, James Polk, 19, 1795. Um, he was born in Pineville, North Carolina, and he was the 11th U.S. president. Uh, Polk served as governor of Tennessee and served as the 11th president of the United States between 1845 and 1849. He was essentially a compromise candidate between the various congressional factions. And is considered by historians to be the last strong pre-Civil War president, in part because he achieved every domestic and foreign goals set out during his presidential campaign. We actually have another president, um, Warren Harding, 1865. There you go. Um, born uh, in, uh, this time for Mr. Harding, he was born in uh, Blooming Grove, Ohio. And he became the 29th president of the United States. Um, only in office for two years until his death, uh, Harding is often ranked among the worst presidents. Um, but if you attended one of Ian's Zoom about U.S. presidents where he uh, essentially discussed at least one good thing each U.S. president has, each U.S. president has done, well, um, as per Ian, well, one good thing that he was able to do was he spoke out against lynching uh which was rampant during the time targeting african americans so uh but i mean like he just i don't know he just spoke out he didn't he didn't really deliver any actions so uh yeah <laughs> and then i think this one i just forgot to skip this uh keith urban it's not his day today but i forgot to skip his slide so we're gonna skip him now all right time to talk about the plays of the week we are going to dominican republic there you go and their national animal is the palm chat which is a type of bird a uh, palm chat is a small songbird found in abundance on the island nation um so uh these birds can usually be found in small flocks or pairs and are highly social they even nest uh communally each member of the nest having its own compartment with a separate entrance. Um, outside the breeding season, they can be seen perching and roosting um, in palm trees or other high places in groups of 8 to 10 birds. And then, and they are a very common sight in both the wild as well as urban areas. So they're very um, abundant. I mean, at least their population is very abundant. Uh, they can be seen throughout um, what about the national flower well we have the uh, Bayahibe rose the Bayahibe rose is a 
the national flower of Dominican Republic. It also, it's also a rare cactus, um, endemic to the Dominican Republic. Uh, the Bayahiba Rose Garden in the village in which it originates is the only place in the world where you can spot this soft pink endangered flower in abundance. I mean, it, it does say abundance, but it's really rare compared to how much or how many there are uh, in the whole world, you know. Set adjacent to the Bayahiba Church, Parroquia Divina Pastora, and in its backyard garden, the flowers make a for a delightful, easy stroll in nature onto the waterfront area of the village. And then um, they have one of these, uh, I would say, traditional game, which a lot of, of, of children in Dominican Republic plays, or even not just children, even adults, actually. It's called Vitia right there. And if you kind of look at it, it kind of looks like baseball, right? Well... It is actually. <laughs> the main difference is that they use broomstick instead of a bat and uh, they use uh, a bottle cap like about the size of a five gallon container you know the cop the the cap for a five gallon container that's it that's what they use instead of a ball so there you go um, what else oh uh, I guess the bases, another main difference would be the bases. They only have two bases in addition to home plate and only two or three fielders. So it's a smaller version of baseball. So, But essentially, it's like baseball. There you go. Alrighty, moving on to our stuff of the day. So for our stuff of the day, speaking of, of this segment, I did say that I have a different uh, theme for trivia for now, at least for this month. And then the word, uh, because we we just got to November, which is the 11th month of the day, of, of the day, <laughs> 11th month of the year. Uh, so I'll be, look, or we're going to be talking about 11 letter uh, words. And then for the trivia, instead of doing the tech trivia since this month will be Thanksgiving, I'll try to get as many Thanksgiving uh, facts as possible or Thanksgiving trivias as possible. Uh, for the rest, uh, it's still the same. So, like for example, this one. Our Disney version animal of the day would be Gil from Finding Nemo. Uh, but Gil is not its um, name as an animal. It's a Moorish Idol. And I believe Joe talked about Moorish Idol back in April of this year. So, yeah, I'm just going to be adding more information on what Joe said. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, again, that's Gil. He's a Moorish Idol. Uh, he's the leader of the tank gang so if you guys remember um the movie finding nebo not finding dory you can still see him in finding dory though but as a minor character finding nebo he's a major character though. so yeah um they are found as far as oh i forgot to change the picture um not so much difference though because there you go you, you see that that's that's the real picture um the one you saw a while ago was the picture of gil a character so again pretty close uh pretty close to the real deal right here so um these fish are found in the indo-pacific oceanic region uh so that means they can be found in countries like japan china uh philippines australia and even here in california you know along the coast um their population is not threatened because the fish being so widely distributed so they're not endangered uh i'm glad they're not <laughs> so usually um when i look at uh, an animal or the national animal of of a country usually they are endangered you know um so at least this is kind of like a uh something for a change uh, they're abundant oh no wait we're not done yet <laughs> i want to talk more about uh, the moorish idol there you go sorry i accidentally uh, uh scrolled using my mouse um anyways uh, these fish, they are known to be shallow water fishes, uh, with these marine creatures mostly living in flat reefs. And for those uh, with a question of, is a Moorish Idol reef safe? Well, the answer is yes. In general, Moorish Idols can be found at depths of approximately 590 feet, almost 600 feet. 
And then they're very, I wouldn't say they're very friendly, but they are docile. They're docile fish and they can coexist with other species of fish or and larger invertebrates um, under the sea. Um, they can often be seen in pairs or in large schools of their own species. Um, when they are in captivity, they tend to show aggression towards other fish if they see that their territory is being threatened. Uh, this in turn also makes them vulnerable to stress and that is not healthy for the fish. <clears throat> uh, their lifespan in cap captivity also decreases. So um, what do you call this? The Moorish Idol is one of those animals that have lower uh lifespan when they when they are in captivity instead of in just in the wild um and speaking of lifespan they have a lifespan between two to four years so and only a year in captivity oh that's not cool so you know what i wouldn't recommend this fish if you want to have a colorful fish in your aquarium just because uh they get stressed easily and uh it, it it lowers their lifespan so i wouldn't advise it just look for a different type of fish all right plan of the day for fall we got the blanket flower blanket flower sometimes referred to as the fire wheel because if come on if you look at it it kind of looks like a wheel but with the red and yellow color combination it's it's like fire right pretty awesome um anyways this flower is indigenous to both north and south america it is a member of the sunflower family. I mean, yes, it does look like a sunflower with a different, uh, uh, how do you say, gradient. There you go. The flowers come in all shades of yellow, orange, purple, multicolored brown, and white. Um, one of the unique features of the bloom is the bending of color at the base of the petals. Uh, it bloom from June through September. Um, and then the, the, these beautiful flowers attract butterflies, honeybees, bumblebees, and birds, which are good for pollination. Um, there's an old Mexican legend that describes the origin of the blanket flower. Well, the thing is it begins in the era of the Aztecs. According to the lore, the um, flower began as solid yellow in color. It was common for women to wear the flower in their clothing and in their hair, um, children ran and played in the fields cloaked in a wild blanket flowers. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> Alright. Oh, I forgot to mention our musical art, or at least artist. Yeah, musical artist of, uh, for the month of November. I hope you would like it, or you would like her, because we have Taylor Swift. Yes, everyone, we're going to be talking about Taylor Swift's songs for the whole month. Of November and uh, let's start with one of her earlier songs um, in 2008 love story there you go that was the time when Taylor Swift was still doing country songs right now she doesn't do country songs anymore more of a pop pop retro kind of style so love story is uh, a song <laughs> written and recorded by Taylor Swift uh, it was released in September 15, 2008 by Big Machine Records as the lead single from Swift's second studio album, Fearless, which was in 2008. Uh, produced by Swift and Nathan Chapman, the song was inspired by a love interest of Swift who was unpopular to her family and friends. And knowing Taylor Swift, a lot of her songs, she, I mean, she base, she bases a lot of her songs from her experience, especially, you know, like the, her, her love life experience um, um <clears throat> i cracked my voice sorry uh uh what was i gonna say oh the uh talking about the song itself the song received widespread critical praise and many complimenting uh swift's writing style and the song's catchiness the single peaked atop the chart in australia where it was certified 10 times platinum by the australian record industry association or ariA um, it reached the top five on charts in Canada, Ireland, Japan, New Zealand, Scotland, and the UK. I'm actually surprised in Japan. Um, uh, well, I don't know why I'm surprised in Japan. <laughs> but, wow, in Japan too, that I didn't know. Um, that just proved 
you know, Taylor Swift's or Miss Swift's talent in music. Just because a lot of countries actually do love her um, style. Um, also, it was one of the best selling singles of 2009 worldwide. In the US, Love Story peaked at number 4 on the Billboard Hot 100 and was certified 8 times platinum by RIAA. So that's pretty amazing. And then we are moving on to Word of the Day. Word of the Day 11 letter word information. A very basic word, but what does it, it actually mean, right? What does it actually mean? Well, first, it's a noun. And uh, let me spell it for you. It's I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N. Information. That's how you spell it. Uh, it means a knowledge that get or a knowledge that you get about um, someone or something and then another definition would be facts or details about a subject so it, it's it's important to know that the word fact is tied to this word information because if you don't give the fact that is misinformation you know and that's the very that's the last thing that people should be doing is to spread misinformation so and i know it's it's hard uh to to uh what do you call this to pass the correct information actually scratch that i wouldn't i i don't think it's hard uh it's uh it's just you know it's i guess it's hard for people with agenda to 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 share the right information to everyone you know and i'm just talking about this in general um but yeah when you say information it has to be factual it has to be uh uh well yeah it has to be factual there you go <laughs> so uh you gotta be certain uh that it is correct it is accurate and uh it's a fact yeah there you go all right, so I did say we're gonna take a pause on the tech trivia for now. Thanksgiving trivia. Instead, did you guys know that turkey uh, wasn't on the menu <laughs> the first Thanksgiving? You might, you may have known this already, especially for our uh, students on Discovery Zoom, because we, I think we did talk about this last year also. So if ever, it's just a reminder. But yes, turkey wasn't always there, especially on the first Thanksgiving. But now. You cannot say Thanksgiving without turkey, right? Or pumpkin pie. So yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, venison duck, or sorry, venison, duck, goose, oysters, lobsters, eel, and fish were likely served during the first Thanksgiving alongside pumpkins and cranberries, but not pumpkin pie or cranberry sauce, not yet. You know, it, it just happened later on. So yeah, again, uh, turkey turkeys were lucky the first Thanksgiving because they weren't I guess they weren't hunted. But now uh, they are they are uh, uh, a synonym for Thanksgiving now. So um, there you have it. We just finished our episode today, guys. Thank you so much for joining me for the whole episode. Uh, I would say half an hour, forty minutes, forty three minutes, maybe an hour. Um, but yeah. I hope you learned something new. I hope you like this episode. Uh, don't forget to leave your thoughts about the topics we discuss in the comment section below. And uh, see you next time. I'm going to have to say bye for now. Bye-bye.